Hello everyone and welcome back to my channel. Thank you so much for joining me today. I have a special guest, Mr. Alec Barr, all the way from Australia. Welcome, good sir. How are you doing today? I'm very well, thanks Dan. How are you doing? Very good. Thank you for coming on my channel. Now, before we get into the nitty gritty, would you like to introduce yourself, tell the audience about who you are, how you got into backgammon? Yeah, sure. Um... So yeah, like you said, I came, I recently returned from Australia. I've been living in Australia for the last five years. And that's probably where I got um, as into backgammon as I am now. Um, before that, I had learned to play. Um, my brother taught me, actually. But it wasn't until, um, that was when I was growing up in London, it wasn't until I got to Australia and we were plunged into quite severe lockdown that I picked up the book. Um, it was Roberti's 501 Backgammon Problems was the first book that I read in in lockdown and i just um oh and I, i've seen an art benjamin lecture as well and i suddenly had this world of dice probabilities open up to me and i, I just looked at backgammon and looked at the combination of the book and art benjamin's mathematics and i just realized how terribly i've been playing the game for so many years and that's kind of where the the engagement all started from amazing so um you're here great to have you on the channel to talk to us today about match score blitzes now, I'm really excited about this talk because I think it's going to be excellent for those people who play tournaments. And also, blitzes just are so common. They come up so often uh, when, you, when you play. So knowing this stuff will really um, fast track um, your game and, and improve. Um, so talk to us, Alec. What, what, what are we going to do today? So, yes, thanks, Dan. I, the, you're absolutely right. This stuff is, is kind of critical for tournaments. And the reason why when you and I were talking and kind of looking at the different topics to do, the reason why I sort of settled on this one is because match score uh, adjustments, um, particularly in blitzy positions, have been something that I have struggled with. It's not, the adjustments have never come intuitively to me. It's sort of something that I've only learned through coaching and sort of endless reading and <laughs> Kit Woolsey articles on five-point matches, endlessly highlighted and come back to. It's just... It's never, um, it took a long time for it to stick. And I think partly it was due to it being presented sort of in a hundred different ways all over the place. And I've, I've tried to sort of synthesize all of my knowledge into one place uh, in the hope that you know, it, can, it can benefit other people. Um, so that's basically what we're going to be looking at. I think it's worth saying that um, I'm, I'm by no means an expert on this. I actually owe a lot of um, the material that's in here, a lot of what's what I learned to my teachers, people like um, Grant Hoffman and, and Mick Diet over in New Zealand and Australia, respectively, they taught me a huge amount. So um, full credit to everyone who's taught me stuff and, and the people on the Backgammon Galaxy um, strategy forum as well, because they're the font of knowledge and I'm just borrowing from their material. Absolutely. We stand on the shoulders of giants. We do so, indeed. Um... So with that um, in mind, uh, I'm not going to, it's impossible to sort of cover off everything. So I've just kind of picked areas of interest or areas that I've struggled with and that you and I have sort of spoken about in the past. So what we'll go over is um, a kind of basic double five blitzing reference position. And we'll explain what a reference position is if, in case people don't know. Um, we'll look at some of the impact on small positional changes to those positions and, and how that affects cube action decisions. Is it a double? Is it a take? Is it a pass, et cetera, et cetera. Then we'll take that knowledge and look at um, some difficult match scores. In particular, three away scores tend to be quite tricky, at least they have been um, for me. Then we go into the fun scores, um, two away, four away, which is just uh, always exciting. Whenever you see that card in a match, you'll always see a backgammon fanatic sort of like um, gripped by what's going on because you know, it's so volatile. Um, and then I thought we could just end on some general rules and advice that I've picked up uh, over the years. How's that sound? Fantastic. Let's get started. Okay. So we'll start with the basics, um, which is we'll take a, a reference position, which is arrived at via this sequence. Um, actually, I'll play the movie. You should be able to see it. Um, so red splits with a 5-2. Um, white then rolls double five and points on both blots, which is the correct thing to do. Red then, unfortunately, dances. White then has the opportunity to double, which they do and red correspondingly drops and i'm hoping my voiceover was timed with the video there but <laughs> you'll see that um that's that's the uh 
that's the reference material, the reference position that we're going to work with throughout this kind of uh, presentation. The reason why um, I skip forward, and the reason, so that, that's a big double path. That's the correct cube action. It's very right to double. It's very correct to pass. Red is still winning 32% in this position, also has a chance, but they're losing 40% uh, gammons, which is just huge. Um, and this is a common reference position. A reference position, for those that don't know, is a, is usually a position that reflects like a borderline decision. So this is this is quite decisive, so it's slightly different to a typical one. But essentially, a reference position is um, something you can learn and then adjust from mentally when you have a variation of that appear uh, over the board. Is that how you define it, Dan? Absolutely. I would add on and that reference positions are commonly seen positions over the board. Not any position can just be made into a reference, but something like the double five blitz um, does come up commonly. So it's a good reference yeah. position to adjust to adjust out from. Yeah, yeah totally. I have um, <laughs> I've <laughs> I've come up with positions that I thought, oh, I found a reference position because it's a borderline take pass, only to find out that that position almost never ever comes up. <laughs> right. So it's completely pointless to try and memorize it. Yeah. Um, cool. So. Here's our reference position for, for the sake of this presentation. And um, it, I, I like this one because it's very decisive. To start with, for a money game, it's a double, it's a big double and a big pass. And you can modify some variables to change the cube action. So cube action fluctuates based on variables in lots of different ways, but one of the ways that it might change is based on um, what happens after red's put on the bar. So let's say red in this position, as you can see here, um, enters low on the board rather than dancing with both. This now becomes a close no double take, um, which for me was super interesting. Like back when I was first starting out, I thought, oh, well, if they enter low, surely they're worse off because they want to be higher up. Um, but the the real ma uh, material in the position is that um, they're less red is less vulnerable to further attack, and white wants to further attack. So by not being high up, they're less vulnerable to further attack, and therefore the cube action is shifted to a no double take. If, however, red comes in higher, well, now they're, they're vulnerable. I mean, they're not as vulnerable as having two on the bar, but they're certainly vulnerable to um, being pointed on or being hit loose from checkers on the midpoint. So now um, it's correct to double, but it's also correct to take. Um, and as you can imagine, if they enter both, then it's a clear no double and a clear take. The gammons actually um, drop by something like 10%, I think. Absolutely. And, and I mean, audience, if you were to stop the video now, which I wouldn't recommend, and just remember, you know, these three positions side by side, there is a huge amount of value in just these three reference positions that Alec has shared, because here you can see just putting the opponent's checker on a different point makes a big difference because of the amount of times it's going to get hit or how it might anchor on a, on a subsequent role. I mean, there's a lot of learning just from these three positions alone. So fantastic star, Alec. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And, and the, the interesting thing is the, the things that we've modified in these three positions is the degree to which um, red is being attacked. So if we, we can make a few other variations. If we go forward and have a look at how changes to our checker distribution affects the, um, the the cube action. So here, red has entered low, which we know from the previous slide would normally be a, a no double take. Um, but now we've kind of artificially put a few more checkers in the zone, um, in, in the space where they can hit um, or make a point. Um, so white now has diversified builders to either attack with or make a new inner board point, both of which would be strong things and thematic to a blitz. Um, so this now becomes a pass, um, a close double pass, which is interesting. So diversified builders, um, which checkers in the zone, changes the position. If um, we have the same setup, but red enters high, well, now what was a double take becomes a double pass because, um, and a big double pass at that, because he's just so vulnerable to being hit. The, the amount of ammunition that white has means that they could just be hit, red could be hit relentlessly um, with loose checkers, um, more combinations make points. Uh, it's just the threats, um, or sometimes we refer to them as uh, market losing sequences, um, are, are really high. And then there's a, a kind of third variation where we now have no more checkers, um, no additional checkers in the zone. But if you can see the, 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 um, 
a checker from the 24 point has been run to the to the midpoint. So usually this would be um, this is a really good thing, right? We've achieved full freedom with one with one checker. Um, but what's interesting here is that the cube action is uh, double and a take still. So the fact that we have escaped one back checker hasn't tipped it over into a pass. We have gained an advantage, but we haven't gained an advantage that affects the cube action. And this is because from a, a game plan perspective, blitzing um, requires that white repeatedly hit red. So positions that have an advantage in them, but haven't added new checkers into the zone, don't um, change the cube action too much. So we kind of hit upon this thing that, yes, advantages in the position change the cube action, but the type of advantages need to be relevant to the game plan. Does that make sense, Sam? Absolutely. I mean, this is very significant as well. So on the right-hand side, part of what makes it a double take is because there are only eight checkers in the zone, whereas the two on the left, there are 10 checkers in the zone, right? Three, 10 checkers. Uh, yes. Um, and, you know, I, I put a video together, I'll, I'll add it to a link called Traffic Light Blitzing, and the difference between 10 checkers, nine checkers, or eight checkers in the zone is, is very significant in terms of taking, passing, or even whether you have an initial double. Um, so it, really good demonstration of just the, the amount of ammunition to carry out the blitz attack can swing the cube decision. Yeah, totally. I, I, I've seen that video. I highly recommend it to anyone watching. It will, it will help kind of um, help you to pass these positions a lot more clearly. So I guess what we've seen is that you have a, a position for money and then it's a reference position where we know the values. Then we change a few things and we can see how those changes impact your winning chances and the number of gammas that you might win and the number of gammas that red might lose. And that correspondingly changes the cube action. So far, this should all kind of make sense. But what about um, match play? What is it about different scores that can have um, the, the same impact in changing cube action decisions? And as we're about to see, they really do. There are dramatic impacts to changes in scores that will affect um, your cube action. And it's, it seems strange because in, in these instances you're about to see, you're not going to see new checkers added into the zone or diversified builders or checkers that escape or anything like that. All we're changing is the amount of points that either player has remaining to win. And that alone has um, a big impact on cube action. The reason why I think this is worth studying um, is I was actually at a, a tournament night recently and I got to a score where I was four away, two away, which we'll see later is a very volatile score. Um, I sent an early cue, took a picture of it, looked at it later, it was a correct cube. And then after the match, I got, um, uh, I'm sure this happens to all of us, a, a bit of a lecture about how my cube action was too early. And um, I was sort of, um, I bit my tongue a bit, but was talking a little bit about match score implications. But the response that I got when I said it's about match score implications was, oh, I don't go in for all that nonsense, which to me just highlights how much of an edge you can gain by learning some of this stuff in a tournament, right? There'll be people who just have no idea and will always cube the same position in the same way, no matter the score. Just learning some of the basic stuff um, okay. should, should hopefully give you an edge. I mean, I have heard verbatim from one of the top 10 UK players on the league table that I'm very good at match play. That's what they said about themselves. And that's why I win more, because I understand yeah. Yeah. when and when not to cube. And I think... It, it's it's hopefully not that confusing and you know you're going on to articulate you know the reasons but it's a really valuable lesson um to improve in your game one of the most important lessons i would argue to really making a quick advance in in your tournament play yeah totally i i think i get the impression that we're seeing more and more literature um around this stuff as well um my copy of Nick Blazer's book is in the post, actually, it's way <laughs> to me. But, um, so I've not read it yet, but I, I know from watching Nick's channel as well that um, you know, that seems to contain a lot of... You know, that's, its sole focus is on adjusting for Absolutely. match play. So it's, it's the, the window of discourse has certainly shifted, which is uh, nice. I think Nick's book, yeah, is definitely excellent, the one on match play. But also the, the article on Kit Woolsey on Five Point <laughs> Matches, you recommended. That's just free to view online. Um, I will link that in as well because that's an excellent uh, addition yeah. to this. But I think what we're doing here on this channel, and Alec is doing so well, is is that we're trying to simplify complicated ideas in Baggammon, and that's really the whole purpose yeah. of my my Baggammon channel. 
I want to take what may seem complicated or new to a to a, a beginner or a, a, a early intermediate player and, and simplify it. So you can use these ideas over the board and see that kind of net gain in, in more wins. Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. And that, to be honest, a channel like this when I was starting out would have been super helpful because Kit Wolsey's article, I cannot recommend um, highly enough. It's just fantastic. Um, but it's very mathsy. And, you know, at a certain point, you start getting into match equities and various take point calculations. It's it's uh, daunting and alienating if you're starting out. So hopefully we're going to pitch this at a sort of a level where we don't have to talk about maths at all, maybe a tiny, tiny bit, um, and we can see how we go. Great. Okay. So um, this could look familiar, at least the, the text should, you know, backgammon is about risk and reward, reward the balance of those two things. Um, and the, the cube is um, what allows you to kind of maximize your rewards um, for a certain risk. And there are, there are ways in which um, there are positions in which it's, it's not right to double, your position is simply not strong enough. It's, there are positions in which you're, um, you're too strong or too likely to win a gallon, um, therefore you play on in match play. Um, there's positions where it's just your opponent's better off by passing. We have this kind of a continuum of doubling decisions. We understand now why that changes or how that can change in uh, money play due to variations in trend checker distribution. But one of the, um, the kind of key things that changes, um, that allows you to move up and down this continuum in match play is that um, the value of gammons um, at stake are, are in flux. So let me, let me try and explain that a bit better. For money, um, the gammon value is always 0.5. I'm not going to go into why that is. There's plenty of articles out there. But whether you're sending a, uh, a two cube or a, um, an eight cube, um, the, the value of gammons is always half. That is not the case in match play. Gammons can sometimes be extremely valuable or they can be not that valuable at all, or they can be killed altogether and can be completely irrelevant. So sometimes when you're playing a match, two points are so valuable to you that you're just going to keep on playing. However slim the gammon chances are, you just carry on playing to the bitter end. Sometimes your lead is so valuable that you don't want to give your opponent the chance to raise the stakes back at you, so you withhold giving them the cube. Um, sometimes you're so far behind in the match, that, uh, in the score, that you want to be aggressive with the cube to gain as many points as possible, as quickly as possible, and um, correspondingly your opponent might be more conservative because they, they don't want to give you that advantage. So the, the most complicated thing in there is the, the gammon value in money games. I, I'd say you don't necessarily need to know the detail of that to understand the next bit of what I'm saying. But essentially, you may have, in a, a, a certain match scores, you may have a position that for money is a no-double take, which then becomes a double take at a score like five-away, three-away, which then becomes a double pass at four-away, two-away. So there is this fluid kind of adjusting. And this is, um, we'll keep coming back to that term, uh, adjusting as we go through. What I'm going to do now um, provided this all makes sense, Dan, is then start looking at particular match scores uh, and their impact on that same double five blitzing position uh, that we started with. Um, because we're going to talk a lot about gammon value, let's just qualify that term a little bit more. So by gammon value, we essentially mean the, the importance of value of winning a gammon at certain match scores. Is that right, Alec? Yeah, yeah. Um... Yes, exactly that. Without going into the, the maths of it, it's your if you need two points to win, uh, winning a gammon to win the to win the match, winning a gammon, um, that gammon is unbelievably valuable. In fact, it's it's the most valuable thing you can have because um, one winning a gammon wins you the match overall. So that gammon is worth um, a huge amount compared to scores where um, you're much further away. 17, 17, 17, or something like that, mm -hmm. um, where the the impact of the gammon is less so, or, or less impactful, I suppose. Trying to avoid the mathematical definition <laughs> is quite tricky. Yeah, no, I think that that's good. Certainly, if you are two away, then winning yeah. the gammon wins a match. So he has a lot of value, a lot of uh, importance yeah. of the match score. Great. Let's uh, let's move on. Yeah. Cool. So, um, oh, so it's a similar thing would be if you're four away and the cube's on two, then winning a gammon then becomes um, super, super valuable because winning a gammon on a two cube wins you the four points that you need that, that are required to win the game. So your gammon value can change based on 
combination of the match score and the the, the number that the queue has been turned to. Yeah. So we're going to start with quite a weird one. I, I like this one. Um, it's had articles written on it, most notably by um, Stick Rice, which you can you can find online. Three away, seven away. Here is our double five blitzing position. Um, if you remember, it was a big double and a big pass. And yet at three away, seven away, so the, the person um, white is three away in, in this scenario, it is now a big no double and a big take, which is, you know, couldn't be more different to the original position that we started at. And all we've changed is the match score. So why is this? So um, Stick, who wrote the, the article I was referencing, has this general rule that says at three away, seven away or greater, so three away, eight away, three away, nine away, um, three away, many away, you should not double as the leader when there are significant gamble chances for either player, of which this position kind of adheres to that rule. Um, because you're trailing so much, your opponent's um, take point is lower than normal. It's around um, 20%. So they've got, already got a low take point. They can, they can take quite um, deeply. When they have taken, your opponent's recube vig is exceptionally powerful. So to define recube vig, it's essentially your ability to like weaponize the cube back at your opponent. So you can, um, you can send that cube, it's the value that's of the cube ownership um, that you acquire by taking it. When you take the cube, you have exclusive ability to use it and you can use it um, aggressively and particularly aggressively and effectively at scores where you're very far away from um, winning because you can gain so much. If you can recube and then suddenly you're playing for four points and there are gamins at stake, all of a sudden you could skyrocket if you won um, up to a really um, strong lead. So a recube big basically um, articulates the the value of cube, cube ownership for the person who's taking it. Absolutely. And, and also you should be very mindful and cautious of protecting your match lead um, so certainly giving your opponent chances to level up or even go beyond you in the score by that recube value um, is, is you just have to be careful, <laughs> be a bit more conservative when you are ahead uh, in the score. Yeah. yeah. The interesting thing about this score as well is that when, if um, let's say that um, you did mistakenly double and white took, the uh, when white recubes, it kills the value of the gammons for, sorry, when red recubes, it kills the value of gammons for white. White is three away. When the cube gets to four, the gammons that they're winning from this position become irrelevant because um, the cube's on four, that represents enough points they needed to win the match. Therefore, they're not getting any added value from the gammons. But critically, the person who's seven away is getting all of the value from their gammons. They now have the ability to win a gammon on a four cube and basically win the, win the match. So it's extremely powerful. When If you take all of that and you kind of package it up and say that's what the cube represents, it represents a huge amount of power. That is essentially the, the recube bit. It, it's what partly makes your opponent's recube take point, their ability to take a redouble, um, so high in this position, which is what's going on. So if we kind of summarize that, if the three away player was to double in this position, they are lowering their own gammon value and increasing the opponents. So why are they lowering it? Because at three away, if they win um, the game by winning a gammon on a two cube, they're winning four points, but they only need three points to win. So that's one point more than what is required. It doesn't sound like it should, that should matter because you're still getting there, but it's essentially, it's a form of wastage. You hear it called wastage or gammon overage. It's, you, you are, you are dialing up the risk by playing for four points when you only need three of them, whilst the other player can really benefit from those four points. And Dirk Schiemann points this out um, in his fantastic book and also in, in a lecture that I think is available on YouTube, that situations where you lower your own gammons and increase your opponents at the same time are the most dangerous. So this is why um, this is why this particular score is so interesting and why it is a clear no double take. And here we touch upon another really important concept, which we will probably come across um, in a moment, which is cube efficiency. And, you know, you touched upon that, how actually winning four points when you only need three points is an overage of, of one. So it's not efficient. 
um, as, as a cube, which is why it would be a mistake to double. So always kind of thinking about how many points you need to win the match or even to get to Crawford ties into this idea of cube efficiency, which is really, again, a really important concept to improve your cubing at, at match scores, along with killing gammons and, yeah. and take points and all those other things you mentioned, Alec, which are also really like fundamental to, to better in your cube action. Cube efficiency... There you go. <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. I was going to say, you mentioned something really important that I haven't touched upon yet, which is about getting to Crawford. We're talking mostly about winning the match by getting the perfect number of points to win um, to win the match by. But getting to Crawford is often almost as valuable as winning the match. Um, it's, it's not quite as good, but um, it's why... You know, if you if you're winning a gap, if you're three away and you're and you win a gammon, an undoubled gammon, you win two points. You get to Crawford. That means your opponent can't use the cube for one round. That's an advantage in and of itself. Mm -hmm. So getting to Crawford is um, not quite as good, but very very valuable. Which is part of the reason why, as the scores get closer and closer to three away, two away, four away, those kind of areas, um, things start to get really sensitive. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. So we, we come to um, the uh, sort of, in my mind, the other most complicated score, which is three away, four away. So the, the question is, should this position um, be better or worse for the leader? What I, what I mean by that is, if it was a no double at three away, seven away, which we just saw, you know, when, when the opponent stands to gain um, only enough to get them to, a, the opponent wins a, a gamut on a two cube, they get to um, three away, three away, it's a 50-50 position. If it's a no double at that point, wouldn't the adjustment be more intense if your opponent is four away and a doubled gammon wins the match? It, my intuitive logic says that we should be making more adjustments, more intense adjustments at three away, four away. And this is, this is kind of proof of where at least my internal logic fails me because that is not the case. What is the case at three away, four away is that um, this is a double and a take. So the first thing to notice is that the that red is already doing better at this score. Red has um, at, at three away, four away as the trailer. Red has forty three percent match winning chances as opposed to <clears throat> excuse me something like twenty three percent before. So the the equity swing in um, winning a few points isn't as great um, as in when you're seven away and you've got more to gain. So to put it another way, the greater the disparity between the points, the greater the, the point delta or the point difference, um, the bigger the deviation should be for money, which is what from money, which is why three away, seven away is a huge adjustment and three away, four away is only a slight adjustment. We still have all the same concerns at this score as the one before, um, but the loss isn't quite as bad. So we still have a gamma overage of one, we still know that winning, um, in this instance, winning a gallon wins the opponent the match perfectly. Red actually has a huge, an even bigger recube big here because white's take point is 40%. So all of these kind of components are in play, um, but because the point differential isn't quite so big, the adjustment is correspondingly not as big. So to kind of evidence the point about recube big, because I know we, we touched upon the definition earlier, you can see from this position, let's... Let's give red a slight advantage. So um, white correctly doubles, red correctly takes. Let's give red a slight advantage by just putting him um, back on the board. Um, again, these are, these are artificial positions. But even without an anchor, even with just two checkers on the board, vulnerable to attack, red already has a, a valid redouble. Um, their recube, if, if you notice, um, will kill the value of white's gammons altogether. Um, which has the un sort of unfortunate effect of leaving White in an overextended position. He doesn't really want his ace point made um, and these big gaps whilst he's still got checkers on the 24 point. There's a lot of work to bring this home. The so White's now in an overextended position. Um, gammons are killed on all sides. So Red is a slight favorite and plays on at DMP or, or double match point. So this is, this is kind of to show just how um, powerful a, a recube um, red can have. And if we give red a slight additional advantage, so we give him an anchor and we give him the five point, now um, it's a huge pass. And by the way, this would be a big take for money. So with a slight improvement in the position, it becomes um, red's 
Riku Big is enacted and it becomes a big pass for white. And that is another reason to be sort of um, that we adjust from the from a pass for money to a take here. Really interesting comparative positions. And XG is like fantastic for doing this, just moving checkers around to see, you know, to try to find those borderlines, which you can then save as reference positions. And earlier you just mentioned the equity swing when there is a bigger disparity between the two scores. And I think an, an interesting exercise is to look at the Rockwell Kazaros match equity table to see how your match winning chances change at different scores. And that's something that will really help you kind of understand more about take points, but also why, why is it a no double? And as you said, it's because of the, the swing you're giving your opponent from, from giving him the potential to throw the cube back at you, uh, weaponize it, um, which is a great, yeah. great term you used, Alec. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I think you have a good point, right? Which is that we we often use XG um, to look at variations in checker positions. You know, what happens if there's one extra builder? What happens if we've got one extra in the board point? What happens if they've made an anchor? Um, but it can be super valuable to just take a position that you you're super familiar with. Um, and then change the match score around it and see how that impacts the decisions. Essentially, you know, a much faster version of what we're doing here. And in fact, when we get to um, two-way, four-way, we're going to see an example of exactly that kind of um, dramatic shift in action. Absolutely. And you could take a photo from maybe a, a, a game you played in a chouette, a cube decision, look at the decision for money, and then start playing around with the scores on XG to see well, is it still a double? Is it now a no double? Is it a pass? Is it a take? So so spend a little bit of time manipulating positions so you really develop a conscious understanding of, of how to use a cube effectively and efficiently at, at different scores. Totally. So um, now I've got three away, three away, so it's an equal score. We won't dwell on this one too much, but essentially this has been included because it would be reasonable to think that Oh, well, the scores are equal, therefore it can't be that different to money. Um, it's let's just let's just operate as if it was money. Um, and it is a double pass at three away, three away, so it is ultimately the same cube action. Um, but it's it's not uh, as big a mistake to not double here. So the reason is is that cube because um, for for money your your take point is. So, at three away, three away, your take point is slightly higher. Again, you're kind of getting close to the end of the game here. We're in sort of scary territory where the entire game can be decided on, um, to, entire match can be decided on one game. Because of that reason and a few others, um, your take point slightly higher, which means that generally speaking, um, you should double more aggressively and take more conservatively. Both sides are gunning for two points to try and get to Crawford, like we spoke, spoke about before. But in this position, um, you, because you're very likely to win a gammon, yes, it's a double and a pass, but if you were to play on too good, um, you're not really making too much of a mistake. And when I say playing on too good, I mean you, um, your, your, your equity in the, by playing on um, is, is higher than you carrying uh, doubling and passing. So you have the ability to play on too good here and you're only making a small mistake. So the reason for including this one is just to show that equal away scores, three away, three away, and five away, five away, um, whilst close to money decisions are not identical. And it's worth when you're playing around in XG to look at five away, five away, three away, three away, two away, two away. It's very interesting. <laughs> you'll, you'll find cubes coming out of all sides of positions when you look at two away, two away. So um, yeah, that's the reason for including that one. And then lastly, for the three away scores, we'll look at uh, three away, two away. So cube action when you're trailing. So here, the same position, you're vastly too good to double. Once again, the, the leader, the two away player, their take point is um, a lot higher than for money. The leader's delighted to see a cube that they can drop in this. You know, they don't want to risk the entire match on a volatile gamanish position where they could lose immediately. And if the leader drops, um, the match is still a 50-50 proposition. The leader drops the cube, it gets a two away, two away, um, it's a, it's uh, you know sort of anyone's game at that point. Um, it's much better than than dropping it three away, three away, where you'd be an underdog after passing. So this is the reason why you don't want to give um, you don't want to give red that easy decision 
you want to um, you want to play on for the gammon and get to Crawford before them. Mm -hmm. So that is probably, since we're talking about a two-away score, that is probably the perfect segue into <laughs> what's been kind of colloquially known. I'm not sure who's called it this, but everyone seems to call it this, the, the power score, two-away, four-away, or four-away, two-away. So if you remember, when we were three-away, four-away, it was still correct to ship the cube. It was a double and a take. So now we're two-away, four-away. What do we think the, the answer is going to be? Well, it turns out this is a much, much more heightened version of the three-way, four-way, because it is a, a an enormous no double um, take. It is incredibly wrong to double here. <laughs> it would be a, an absolutely monstrous blunder to double as the leader here, because you're just giving away so much value. Mm -hmm. you know, it, it's the most volatile score because Gannons um, win the match perfectly. So for for the trailer, um, at the three-way, four-way score, the leader still benefits from winning a gammon on a two-cube, even though there's an overage, that, that one extra point that they don't need, and they still benefit from that because they win the match. But here, there's zero benefit. At two-away, the leader can just capitalize on the 40% gammon winning chances that are already in this winning position. So no need to cube and give all the power to the opponent and put the entire match on the line killing all the gammons killing the, the value i think we need to underline and emphasize that point yes um because it's really significant and this score if there is one takeaway from this video it's got to be the four away two away score which yes. in tournaments i've seen many people cube too early at these scores or, or not early enough in fact if you're the trailer um and here by cubing when you're two away you're just killing all gammon value for yourself um yeah yeah. yeah, here it is. Yeah, this is exactly it. Yeah, <laughs> opponent takes, immediately recues, um, even as the underdog, kills the opponent's guns. Very happy to play on. They have 32% match winning chances in this position. It's it's strong. And they and, and again, White now has that overextended position. It's not it's not the easiest one to, to bring home. So um, yeah, as you can imagine, that one, of, one of the things about this score is that we talk about it being the power score, but the power really lies with the trailer. Um, which is which is why um, I've included this kind of the powerful side of the power <laughs> score version like where we, we flipped it around and now you're dramatically too good to double. Your opponent would, of course, pass in a heart, uh, in a heartbeat <laughs> um, straight away. So you, you just want to win the game and get two away, two away. Um, and uh, sorry, it says redouble there, but it should say uh, two away, two away. You can double with the tiniest advantages. For reasons that we won't go into in this presentation but um you know, get to that score and then get a small advantage play the match out as a favorite so mm -hmm. it's super volatile everything becomes adjusted you know to sort of um a one degree or one level beyond what you would normally do if not more and i think my favorite sort of theoretical thing to talk about when talking about four way two way two way four way is that so, so we can look at a fictional position. So just to highlight the incredible volatility of this score. So imagine it's the start of the game and you're trailing four away, two away. And what happens is you roll an opening um, three, one, and then your opponent um, doesn't get their turn. It goes straight back to you. So this is what the position would look like. And all, and all credit to um, Sebastian Wilkinson showed this to me. And I remember being amazed. So this position rolling a three one and getting to have your turn immediately at four away two away is already a double pass it is that th that is how <laughs> crazy an impact this score has um and it's narrow but it's it's still correct um and if you know this then you should know that anything more than this um is like is likely to be a double pass if not already too good this is a fantastic position to remember a really good reference and actually, if you have a four point made, I think then it's a borderline um, take pass. And, and I think that it's so interesting, this uh, as a reference, because not only does it show you that after the best opening roll, you have a 10% increase already in, yeah. in your winning chances, but also like the gammons, you know, it's, it's just so dangerous to take. And actually by dropping, you put your opponent at an inefficient score at three away. Um, so really, you want to force yourself um, into even scores and your opponent into odd away scores. And that ties up into that idea of cube efficiency. 
than being yeah. two away or four away or even eight away. Certain scores just are more favourable to, to the cube. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, totally. I think also people forget that in the opening position, the opening setup of the backgammon board, both sides are winning 14% gammons, which is already a medium amount mm -hmm. of gammons, right? Like if you're getting into a holding game or a racing game, your gammon rate is what zero to two, three, four percent. It's low, so your gammons are higher at the start of the game from the from the opening position. And here, your opponent makes the strongest point, gammon goes up, and yeah, it's a, it's <laughs> very valuable. There's a lot to learn from this. You can't. I think it's also. Oh, you go. No, go ahead, Alec. Yeah. I was I was going to say that there's. I think you can also um, say, and I, I actually don't know um, how true this holds up uh, absolutely, but at four away, two away, um, generally speaking, if you've made a point and a split, you probably have a cube. Um, there'll be exceptions, I'm sure, but that's quite a good rule of thumb to go with, I think, at that score, yeah. being super aggressive. I think another really good rule of thumb as well is certainly before every new game starts, look at the scoreboard, look at the match score and think of the gammon value, think of the cube efficiency, all the things you, you've mentioned, Alec, in the video. And, you know, when you get a four away, two away score, a bell should go off somewhere in yeah. your head and you'd be like, if I'm four away, I can be mega aggressive more than pretty much any other score. Four-way, two-way yeah. is like a red light um, to say, yeah. I'm cubing after any any good initial sequence. And even three-way, two-way, you have to wait a little bit longer to cube. Yeah. But again, you should be thinking, I need to be more aggressive. And a common mistake a lot of newer players make is they're just not aggressive enough with a the cube. They lose their market, and then the opponent gets a lucky sequence, and then... Yeah. There you go. <laughs> it's, it's like that sort of classic advice where a, a student goes to their their backgammon coach and is like, I don't know what to do. I'm just, you know, I'm not. Um, I keep getting dinged for not cubing enough. What what can I do to improve my um, cubing? And the answer is just cube more. <laughs> it's sort of, it's that simple. Um, just try it out, and you're especially at these kind of match scores. It's yeah, unlikely like to be radically wrong. And like a post Crawford, you know, if you're not sure, then just cube a two away, two away. Just cube on the opening roll. <laughs> you know, if you're not sure, yeah, just chuck it in. Yeah, yeah. that's a that's that's a great heuristic. I love it. <laughs> so so actually, that kind of leads us right to the end um, nicely. Where you have mentioned some kind of general advice that I haven't even put in here, which is look at the score say the score in your head i actually say the score I, one of the things that i find quite tricky is that in tournaments your score is displayed by the number of points you've accrued not the number of points you are away from winning mm -hmm. so i always transpose it in my head so you know if it's a five point match and i've won one point i say to myself four away five away it just makes more sense to me you know, it's how i've learned the the match score implications um and it just then it becomes irrelevant how at how many points in total the match is, you're just looking at how far away you are. So transposing transposing that in your head, I think can be quite useful. Um, we talked, uh, to go kind of back over stuff, we talked about this adjusting um, by different levels or different grades. I think knowing that you can and should be adjusting and reminding yourself that, okay, this score, um, I need to make an adjustment is useful. And take note of the gammons in the position. One of the things that I was always really guilty of um, is, Take, taking cubes um, where I've got strong winning chances, but the gammon losses are really high because I've just ignored it. I'm, I'm, well, I'm, I can win from this position. I've got more than 25%. I've got 30%, but I ignore the gammon losses and, you know, think lots lying around, many checkers outside of your home board, um, lots of threats, points about to be made on your head, points about to be made at home in the home board when you're on the bar, two checkers on the bar. All of these things should be screaming. Gammons are elevated. And, and that should be a, a trigger, I think, as well as the score. Um, our score disparity. Oh, sorry, you go. Now you continue with the score disparity, Alec. <laughs> well, it was it was just that thing we talked about before. Um, the greater the point disparity, very often the greater the adjustments uh, that you make, rather than closer to scores. There are exceptions to that. Um, we know that scores that five away, five away, three away, three away, those even scores are different to money, and it's worth learning um, in what way they're different to money. Um, it's, it's probably worth mentioning that they're different for gammonish positions in a different way to non-contact positions. None of this that we've talked about is re referencing non-contact positions. This is all in you know, where there are gammons at stake. 
um, that's probably a separate thing to look at. <laughs> yeah, because um, even a two away, four away, if you are the leader, that's not to say you can never double. Certainly, if you're in a no contact bear off position, it is right to double, even though you know you're going to get recouped in most, in most yeah. instances. So it's again xg you just need to spend time <laughs> on xg yeah um, we can't fit everything into one video um yeah <laughs> yeah yeah totally and um dan already said this decisions that even away scores are typically more important than the odd away scores because of cube efficiency we play with a cube that we play odd mat odd point match scores and we play with an even doubling cube and that means that even away scores are the ones that um uh, you need to watch out for and then in terms of adjustments, again, generally speaking, at scores where you're trailing, be slightly more aggressive, maybe adjust half a level or so up. At scores where you're ahead, be slightly more conservative than for money, so generally adjust half a level down or so. If the score involves three away or two away on either side, maybe just think twice as hard about your cube decision. Um, it could be a whole level up or down that you you kind of modulate um, because those scores are getting close to the, the winning number. And then, yeah, like you said, Dan, two away, four away, four away, three away, and three away, two away. These are all really sensitive scores. So think super hard about your cube action and probably adjust more than, than one whole level. Um, redoubling is sort of a topic in its own right, but generally speaking, you can redouble very aggressively when you're, when you're trailing if your opponent has a lot of gammons to lose. And generally speaking, they should be more conservative in those positions. So that's that recube pick that we talked about. Um, and remember that that first position that we looked at, the recube big as the trailer at three away, many away, is really huge. So uh, you can often redouble even as the, the underdog. And that's about it, I think. <laughs> I mean, as, as a shout out, um, Tim Cross has a traffic light system. Um, you can contact Tim about that, where he talks about being more aggressive or less aggressive with the cube at certain match scores, whether it's a red or an amber, um, certainly worth um, contacting him for lessons um, mm. if you want to kind of know more. Um, and you mentioned underestimating gammons, and and I was I was recently in the Midlands Open final, um, which I recorded. You can watch that video on my channel, and I I took a, a, a bad cube. I think it was about a two hundred uh, blunder. And it was simply because I massively underestimated the gammons for my opponent. And I think sometimes you can think to yourself, well, I know at this score my take point is 26%. I have over 26%. It must be a take. Well, that's not always the case because you have to factor in the gammons. Um, and some of those initial blitz positions, when your opponent has 40% gammons against you, that needs to be factored back into yeah, um, yeah. the winning chances. Um, and those adjustments, we won't go into the maths, but you can look those up online about half the gammons against your winning chances and, and, and so on. Um, yeah. So there's one more thing, um, Dan, which is, a, which is a bit of a surprise. I haven't shown you this yet, <laughs> but I wanted to... I wanted to um, so whilst I was doing this, um, putting this all together, it was obviously a great refresher for me and I was going through sort of an endless amount of material that I have saved and got a big sort of mind map of all these things linked together because all this information is not un unique to me at all. It all exists in Kit Wolsey's article, in things that Phil Simborg has written, in Tim Cross's traffic light system, like it's in, in Dirk Schumann's incredibly sort of mathematically driven theory of background. It's all there. My, my trouble was being able to remember what I needed to remember at the point that I needed to remember it, synthesizing all of that material <laughs> into one place. So it's been quite good to do this. One of the offshoots of doing this, which I can show you briefly, is I've been working on um, an app, and this, this is very early stages. This is like a super, super high, high level preview. Um, but essentially, this app is my attempt to synthesize all of the stuff that's out there into uh, one place. So if the video works, you can see this is a prototype. It's, it's just on my computer, but you can select. The idea is that you would select your score. You know, I'm three away, four away, and four away, three away, um, or whatever it may be. Um, you can flip those around to whatever score you want. And then you could click go and it will take you through to, a, I guess, like a crib sheet of 
information that is critical. What's the gallon value? What's the requeue take point? What's the dead queue take point? Like the facts, but then also advice to myself. So I wrote this as a tool for me to learn advice to myself about, okay, if I'm doubling and it's a contact situation, what do I need to know? Do I need to be aggressive? Do I like putting it into more human terms? You can flip the score around and stuff like this. Um, this is, this is, very very early stages of me trying to like codify everything we've been talking about but my aim is that um something like this or to be honest any kind of crib sheet that is useful to to you as an individual should like i want to be able to play xg and then come across a match score that i'm not so sure about and then be able to look at this and go okay so the things i need to consider are recube take point being aggressive recube big or something like that so this will this will be in the pipeline <laughs> somewhere down the line but um I'd be interested to know your thoughts. It looks fantastic as a resource and something that I would benefit from, certainly, as well as many of my audience. So uh, look forward to the official release date on that, Alec. Any idea when it's going to be live? <laughs> a, a long way down the line, <laughs> I would say. <laughs> okay. I, I need to, like I said, it's, it was actually just, I just built it for my own benefit and it's, you know, it needs to be um, developed properly. But it will, I'll, I'll keep i'll keep everyone up to date with it if it's something that people are interested in absolutely yeah please do so and i'll, I'll shape that out on my channel in a future video um okay. alec it's been amazing um thank you so much for putting together a presentation for sharing your ideas i mean there's so many concepts you know that you've covered that are really central to improving your cubing, um, whether that's understanding gammon value or understanding recube vig, or you know, all these things are all kind of tools, you know, to, to getting a better understanding of it. And certainly if you spend time on XG, you even just put in the money game blitz we started with, and then you move around the score, then it's gonna come up when you play. Yeah. It's gonna come up over the board, and you're gonna want to make sure you don't take a pass and end up losing four <laughs> points when you could have been one point. You know? Yeah, very true. Because very true. believe well, me, thank but... you so much. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, thank you so much for having me on the channel. Um, yeah, it's been great. It's, it's, there's a lot of dense information there, so I feel like people <laughs> will hopefully benefit just by sort of maybe watching it in chunks or screenshotting bits along the way. No, it's been fabulous. And uh, maybe we'll have like one fewer person by the water cooler bemoaning that they took the blitz cube that they should have <laughs> dropped um okay, so you okay. know it's a, it's a benefit to the community and please guys check out my other videos on cube efficiency on losing your market on traffic light um check it in the zone i will copy them all in as well as a Wolsey article as well as the stick rice article spend time be happy thank you so much alec for coming on any last words just thank you for having me and yeah I, your channel is fantastic like i if when i was starting out i was just doing endless reading and saving positions and stuff down having the video content bite-sized stuff is great so yeah very grateful for everything you put out into the world many thanks alec well i see you at the next tournament <laughs> all the best mate bye-bye yeah